America faces a lot of enemies right now, foreign and domestic, but from the perspective of the people who run the country, there's really just one enemy, and that's faithful Christians. Now, nobody ever says that out loud, of course. Nobody ever says anything very meaningful out loud in the United States anymore. But if you're interested in who they really hate, well, look at what's happening. So Christian churches across the country have been burning and no one in the government is doing anything about it. Look at how Christian churches are treated during COVID. Strip clubs stayed open, weed dispensaries stayed open, liquor stores stayed open, but Christian churches were closed because public health. We talked the other day to a guy who's facing 11 years in prison federal felony charges from the Biden administration for praying at an abortion clinic and daring to sing hymns. So if you are a faithful Christian, not a fake Christian, David French Christian, but an actual Christian of the kind this country has always had, of the kind this country was created to harbor, actually, uh, you are seen as an enemy by the people who run it. Okay, welcome back to Mocha Don is Right. I am Mocha Don. And today I have discovered that I am a um, Christian nationalist. And being a Christian nationalist and being white, I think I'm also a white Christian nationalist, which sounds like a pejorative to me. This term has been really difficult to define. And that's been intentional. The reason it's been difficult to define is because the term is meant as a pejorative. The, the term is meant as an insult. And it sounds racist to me. I wonder, are there black Christian nationalists? White Christian nationalism. Then, then it all fit. This was all part of the same game. White Christian nationalism is a triple word score. Especially, again, that's why you have to add white, okay? And white is the most important part of this because, again, in our particular context, whiteness identifies those who established the hegemony. Christian identifies the system, the ideology that whites use to establish the hegemony. And nationalism identifies the, 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 the borders around this particular hegemonic power. So white Christian nationalism is a triple word score, and it all has to do with oppression. This is not something different. It's the same thing. This is critical theory and cultural Marxism. I'm talking about white Christian nationalism. By the way, um, I am the resident in a Christian nation. For the last seven years, I've lived in Zambia. Listen to this from the preamble of the Constitution of the Republic of Zambia. We, the people of Zambia, acknowledge the supremacy of God Almighty, declare the Republic a Christian nation, while upholding a person's right to freedom of conscience, belief, or religion. Here's why this is interesting. Because the triple word score white Christian nationalism tries to imply that the very concept of Christian nationalism is something that somehow, you know, emanates from America. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just wondering. I just want to ask them. <laughs> what, what, what are my deep, dark, chocolate Zambian brethren trying to do? The idea of a secular nation is a very recent idea. Well, obviously I'm white, but what makes me Christian while well, I'm a Christian? Well, what makes me a nationalist? Well, I believe uh, that we should be trying to make America great again by basically putting the concerns of Americans above most of our international concerns, not meaning that we should be completely isolationist or that we have no role in the world, just that we should probably take care of our own first, you think? Um, that's the Make America Great Again motto, and it has very little to do with Donald Trump, other than that he came up with a slogan. I like Donald Trump, but I, I don't uh, deify Donald Trump. And when Donald Trump uh, 
passes on, hopefully after his next term as president, we'll have someone to replace Donald Trump. But we're going to stay with the Make America Great Again, which is called the America First Agenda, uh, because America should be first because we're Americans and we live here. I think that is what makes me a nationalist. I'm a Christian because I believe in Jesus Christ. And while I'm probably not a great Christian or a super good Christian, and I suppose um, my beliefs differ from those of some other Christians, uh, I am a Christian, and so uh, that makes me a Christian nationalist. Um, Obviously, the fact that I'm white would make me a white Christian nationalist. I would suppose the fact that I don't think we should cut the genitals from our children or give them uh, drugs which will destroy their development for life would make me a transphobic white Christian nationalist. This is a very peaceful group of people. As best as I can tell, it's primarily socialists who are fascists. Remember, Nazi stood for National Socialist Party. So the socialists are the fascists. The communists are also fascists because they use force rather than any democratic process. So if you're trying to protect our democracy, you can't really be a communist or a socialist because communism and socialism are completely inconsistent with democracy. But nonetheless, we're a republic and and our individual states are democracies. The nation itself is a republic governed by a constitution that all the states agree to comply with. And of course they don't because they seem to ignore the uh, first, second, fourth, fifth, and 12th amendments all of the time. But let's talk for a minute about the idea that there should be a separation between church and state. Well, I mean, maybe there should be, and maybe there shouldn't be, but that's not what the constitution says. Let's take a look at the First Amendment. Congress shall pass no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So there is no actual separation of church and state. It just means you can't have laws compelling people or compelling the government to be of a particular religion. That is not a separation of church and state. Obviously, you can have Jews and Christians and Muslims and Baha'is and Hindus all serving in our government, but there is nothing that says that you can't pray in school, for example. Certainly, you should be allowed to pray in school. I think what it says is that the school teacher, who is an agent of the state, cannot impose on you what prayers you can say. That's not a separation of church and state. That's a separation of the state from a, any single particular church. Now, the, the 13 colonies were all founded, every single one of them, were founded on uh, some sort of religious premise. Uh, I think with the exception of Maryland, who was, which was Catholic, I think the rest were some form of Protestant religion, and that is simply how this country was formed. Again, the idea of a secular nation, that is a very recent concept. It's one that hasn't worked very well. Listen, listen to this. Listen to this oath that, that he took. I, Charles III, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain, and of Northern Ireland, and in my other realms and territories, king, defender of the faith, do faithfully promise and swear that I shall inviolably maintain and preserve the settlement of the true Protestant religion as established by the laws of Scotland in prosecution of the claim of rights, and particularly an act instituted, an act of securing the Protestant religion and Presbyterian church government and by acts passed in both kingdoms for the union of the two kingdoms together with the government, worship, discipline, rights, and privileges of the Church of Scotland, so help me God. Again, we, we just made this up in America, right? And we just, we just made this up for the purpose of oppression. Interestingly enough, again, 
that's not new. Charles didn't just invent that oath, among all the other oaths that he took, he wanted the Church of England as well. But he, he, Charles didn't just invent that oath. That oath has been taken by kings in Great Britain for hundreds of years. Why is that important? It's important because people are arguing that this idea is something that is new, something that is made up, something that we're forcing, for example, on America and on America's history. But you, you can only believe that if you're ignorant of who came here and established America and why. For example, in the Mayflower Compact, in the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc. Again, this, this is in 1620, and it's the same language that Charles just spoke not long ago. Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for the better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. In other words, we're establishing ourselves as a body politic in order to advance the goal, the advancement of the kingdom. And again, what's the argument that we often hear? The argument that we often hear is, yes, yes, that might have been true. And I, either these people didn't really mean it, or that was then, but everything changed later on. Everything's changed later on because, you know, we, we have the First Amendment. And clearly the First Amendment was established by a group of people who had recognized the superiority of secularism because they were secularist and deist and whatnot. They knew better. They knew better than to try to establish some kind of religion. Well, that's one possibility. But there's another possibility. And before I tell you what that possibility is, let me just give you a few more pieces of information. Connecticut was founded by the Puritans. And they said specifically, to gather, to maintain, and pursue the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess, as also the discipline of the churches, which, according to the truth of the said gospel, is now practiced among us. It just sounds like a secular people who couldn't wait to get rid of religion in the First Amendment. Delaware didn't establish a particular church, but they declared a right to religious freedom exclusively for those who, quote, profess to believe in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Georgia was officially a, a Protestant state, but they required their public office holders to be Protestant. Maryland was originally founded by Catholics, but was formed as an explicitly Christian nation requiring its new constitution, in its new constitution that public office holders declare a belief in the Christian religion. Massachusetts was a Puritan Congregationalist colony. New Hampshire agreed to be governed by godly and Christian laws. New York, founded as New Netherlands, codified religious liberty for all Christians. New Jersey required that its public office holders be Protestants. North Carolina also had a religious test. Pennsylvania also had a religious test. Rhode Island also required that their office holders be Protestants in good standing with local churches. South Carolina declared Protestantism, Protestantism to be its official religion. And Virginia was officially Anglican. So, did all of these people come together and decide, listen, we've been wrong all these years, and what we need to do is come together and establish a secular state? Or did they say, because we as individual states have state religions, or 
official Christian practices and policies. We don't need our federal government to establish one for everybody. You tell me which one of those things makes more sense. And again, this does not mean that we jump onto this bandwagon that says, you know, America is this special nation or America is this new Israel or America is this whatever. Wrap the Bible and the cross and the flag? Absolutely not. There's no getting around those facts. This was formed as a Christian nation. I think the time came where recognizing that in the past, the king, uh, being the head of the church, had imposed specific religious ideology on the people. The founders, in their wisdom, said that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What that means is that we aren't going to say you have to be a Protestant. We aren't going to say you have to be a Quaker. We're not going to say you have to be a Presbyterian, which was basically the religion imported from England. But there are a lot of oaths and a lot of things in, in the original founding documents of the colonies which uh, had specific, narrowly defined religious commitments. And that, uh, that was done away with, not to eliminate church from the lives of the people or from the people being able to bring their religious views into their roles in government, but was actually done uh, to prevent the Protestants from banning Catholics or to pre prevent the Presbyterians from banning uh, Lutherans, or to prevent the, um, you know, the Quakers from banning the Presbyterians, or the Angelicans from banning the Mormons. These are things that aren't permitted. But there is no separation of church and state. There's only a separation of the state from adhering to any particular religious view, that would prevent the United States, for example, from becoming a Muslim country. And to say the United States is a Christian country is not correct. We are not a Christian country. We were a country founded on Judeo-Christian beliefs. And should we teach Christian morality in schools? Well, I don't know. What's your objection to Christian morality? Thou shalt not murder. Wait, excuse me. Thou shalt not kill, which meant murder. Uh, you know, you don't covet your neighbor's wife or property. You don't steal. These are not things in great dispute. In fact, similar sets of guidance appear in all of the major religions of the world. So why is it that this is suddenly a problem? Is there a problem with me being white? If you have a problem with me being white, I would say you're racist. If you have a problem with me being Christian, or you don't like my particular Christian views, well, that you have a right to that opinion, but who cares? If you don't like the fact that I'm a nationalist, which is really just patriotic because everything is on a scale, right? You can be a nationalist that thinks that America, while not being isolationist, can still focus on its own citizens and its own issues first without deciding that America should conquer Canada and conquer Mexico and expand the American view to the rest of the world. I think that's um, something we've learned doesn't work very well and it's a bad idea. I don't think being um, nationalist means we can't uh, meet some of our obligations to help Ukraine, which I think we have done. It doesn't mean that we can't help Israel, which we've done and we will continue to do. It doesn't mean we can't be a member of 
the United Nations, although I would question the value of that at this point. But what it does mean is that on the continuum of nationalism from being somewhat patriotic to being um, a, a radical Nazi-type nationalist, we should fall somewhere on the uh, side of the spectrum where it's primarily patriotism and putting America's concerns first. After all, you have to put your mask on first on the airplane so you can help the other passengers, and America needs to be able to take care of its own affairs if it's to help anyone else in the world. I don't think that's an extremist nationalist view. But hey, I used to think I was a libertarian-leaning Republican, and here I found out that I'm a, a Christian nationalist, a, a conservative, transphobic, white Christian nationalist. I don't think we should shut up about that. I think we should embrace that, at least the Christian nationalist part. And uh, I don't think we should back down from that. I think if someone calls you a Christian nationalist, you should take that as a compliment and thank them. Because what they're trying to do is change the language to be something negative. Calling you a Christian nationalist is a pejorative that assumes that because you're a nationalist, you're a Nazi. By the way, the Nazis, while most of Germany was Christian, the Nazis really didn't like Christianity. Um, the Nazis thought the state, and, and, and if you wanted to be a Christian, the state should be able to tell the church what to teach. And, and the, the state religion would have the state come first in your Christian views. That, by the way, is what fascists believe, and that is what the left, the socialist, woke, communist, Marxist left in this country believes. Uh, the other thing that was true about the Nazis is they didn't have any problem cutting the genitals off anyone they wanted to. That also appears to be something the left, socialist, communist, Nazi, fascists in this country believe. That entire woke ideology is just a form of Marxism. With that being said, there are people now writing books. Uh, they tend to think rural, white rural people tend to be Christian nationalists, I think. I live in suburbia, so I'm not urban, I'm not rural, I'm suburban. I'm a suburban libertarian-leaning Republican who happens to be a transphobic white Christian nationalist, although I'm really not afraid of trans people. I just think they need help. They're mentally ill. I'm not backing down from the moniker of being a Christian nationalist. I will, I will fly that flag. Is there a Christian nationalist flag? Is the Gadsden flag a Christian nationalist flag? Because I normally fly the Gadsden flag. If you fly the Gadsden flag, like, comment, subscribe, and tell me in the comments that you fly the Gadsden flag. That's the flag I fly. I don't think it's a white Christian nationalist flag, but uh, what should we embrace as the Christian nationalist flag? In these questions that they asked about you know, white Christian nationalism, uh, a large number of Jews surveyed were white Christian nationalists because of the ridiculous questions that they used in order to make that determination. So yeah, it depends on who's asking. But at the end of the day, this is a power play. And we should not, we should not bow to the power play. We need to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And by all means, don't let people use this, what is often a fake question, a complete sleight of hand to make you back off or to make you ashamed to be a part of this wonderful republic. Because God's been good to us. Amen? Amen? God's been good to us. And I, for one, am grateful. So if you're opposed to black Christian nationalists, are you a racist? 
Or are you only not a racist if you're opposed to white Christian nationalists? Confused. And I'm also confused, by the way, if you're not a nationalist, which is a spectrum from patriotism to batshit crazy, uh, I'm over on the patriotism side of that scale. But if you're not a nationalist, what are you? You want a one world order? You know, one world orders result in war. People are entitled to their culture. You want a multicultural society which celebrates everybody's unique culture. You can't have that in a one world order. It's impossible. As people break down into nations, which are places of somewhat homogenous thought, perhaps the same language, perhaps the same religion, mostly, perhaps they are of a similar ethnic background. As people break down into their preferred groups, this is tribalism 101, then how are you going to bring these groups together? Well, you can't put them in a blender, right? I mean, unless you really are a Nazi. So what you would have to do is you would have to say, well, you know, we'll let you guys, for the most part, uh, do whatever you want to do. You might set up something like, I don't know, a republic and say, as long as you don't violate people's human rights, we'll define those rights in something, we'll call it a constitution. And, we'll, and if everyone disagrees, we're, you know, 75% majority disagree, we can amend the constitution, the amendment process. But let's, uh, let's have a constitution of these different areas, we'll call them states, and, and in your individual areas, why well, you have a democracy. But then, collectively, you're represented in, in sort of an undemocratic way. The House of Representatives is a representative democracy, and the Senate represents the states and their individual interests. As they're, they're, uh, since I think it was the 16th Amendment, they're, they're democratically elected maybe it was the 17th Amendment, they're democratically elected within the state. But you only have two senators for California, and you have two senators for Wyoming. So there's no population connection there. They represent the states they come from. That, to me, seems like a very good way and a very wise way to organize things. And in order to prevent a violent rebellion from people who disagree... We're going to elect the House of Representatives, which is the most democratic body, a representative democracy, the people's house. We're going, to rep we're going to have those elections every two years. But in order to keep the tyranny of the majority from trampling the 49% minority, we're going to have the Senate, uh, and, and that's going to be a little less volatile. That's only going to be... Ele senators are going to only be elected every six years, but we will elect one third of the senators every two years. So you always have a vote coming up. I mean, you're not going to want to rebel and be violent unless the government's really trampling on you, unless the government has become tyrannical. And if the government ever does become tyrannical, we have the Second Amendment to deal with that. The people. Uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, and that's so that they can form militias and they can overthrow a tyrannical government, which is why military weapons would be protected under the Second Amendment. Uh, they're not protecting hunting. They're protecting your ability to defend yourself Yes, against criminals, but also against a tyrannical government. And this government we have now is starting to look pretty damn tyrannical. However, we have an election coming in November, and in that election, the entire House of Representatives, 435 voting members of the House of Representatives, will be elected. And you can vote for the representative that allegedly most represents your views. I say allegedly because 
a lot of times when they're elected, they become something different than what they said they were. But nonetheless, you can vote to throw the bums out. All of them, all 435 voting members of the United States House of Representatives, uh, I think 33 or 34 states will have uh, elections for United States, at least one of their two United States Senate seats. And so you can vote to throw the bum out that you don't like that's in there and put someone you do like in there. And then we also have the president of the United States who is not elected by the people, but the people instead are polled through an election. And that poll instructs their state legislature who they want the legislature to appoint electors for in the electoral college. And so the electoral college is a relatively undemocratic way of ensuring that the states elect a president that represents their interests. And the states have chosen through what the Supreme Court describes as the special franchise to allow the people to vote and they so far honor that vote. And those are the slate of electors that they send to the electoral college to vote. So, so in an indirect way, we do elect the president of the United States, not by popular vote, but state by state. And this seems to me to be a, a way to run a government, which prevents civil war. If you really want a civil war, get rid of the Electoral College and let California, Illinois, and New York decide who's going to be the president every year, uh, every four years. And that's going to be bad news. You're going to have a civil war. If you want a civil war, you know, stack the Supreme Court, right? We have three branches of government. The Supreme Court's not elected. They're appointed. They're appointed for life for a term of good behavior. And we don't want to pack the court because if you pack the court, say Democrats say, well, you know, we're going to add 10 liberal members to the court. Then the Republicans get in, they'll say, well, let's add 20 conservative Republicans to the court. And now you've got a court of 39 and you begin to have insanity. And so let's leave the court alone, conservatives, Republicans, and Christian nationalists have been very good about accepting things that the court has said without being violent about it. By and large, Christian nationalists really, really disliked Roe v. Wade. And and through a multi-decade process, really a 50-year process, they were able to fight back against that. Hardly, hardly a dictatorial fascist arrangement there. A 50-year process of fighting against Roe v. Wade. And did we get an abortion ban? No, we didn't. What we got was the individual states are going to decide for those people in that state. Now, there's some arguments of why it might be a problem, you know, that you can actually have a partial birth abortion at the end of the term of gestation, uh, half deliver a baby and murder it. Um, that is that is an argument to be made, but it is not something that the federal government is is imposing on the states. The people who live in the states are going to set those rules, and maybe— one day the federal government will say something like, you know, this child is a human being with rights separate from the mother's, and this this human being and its rights supersede the mother's after some period of time. About 75% of the American people support abortion on demand during the first trimester. A little less than half, and it could be a lot less than half if you start to get to the end of the second trimester, will support abortion on demand to the end of the second trimester. Almost nobody, 
90% of people surveyed oppose third trimester abortions. So I guess if you think an abortion of a healthy child to a, uh, from a healthy mother's womb in the ninth month of pregnancy, if that is acceptable to you, then I would argue if I'm a white Christian nationalist, you're a fascist, murdering communist. And actually, communism killed a hundred million people in the 20th century. Think about that. That's the direction the woke left wants you to go. Anyway, that's my um, rant for the day. Please like, comment, and subscribe. We really need subscribers. Please um, leave a comment. Let me know. It's been a while since I did a video, and I wanted to get this one out before I travel to the People's Republic of California to see my two of my four grandchildren. Fortunately, another two of my grandchildren live here in Reno. They live in a free state, but I'm going to actually hold my breath and go visit the uh, People's Republic of California for almost a week. But like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think. We're a new channel. We need your help. We need your subscriptions. God bless, and you have a fantastic day. Ready, stand by.